Hello freaks and geeks. So I have discovered a pedophile apologist and someone who wants to lower the criminal sentencing on pedophiles. And this person is a self-proclaimed prison abolitionist. The man you see before you goes by the name of Tony Robert Cochran. Now Tony looks like a very harmless guy, but there is more to him than meets the eye. This man is a criminal and convicted of a really messed up crime. He's a liar and a manipulator. And I'm gonna tell you all about him. Devil's Advocate is back on duty. Now, before we get into the meat and potatoes of this video, we have to first understand who exactly we are talking about here. Once again, this man's name is Tony Cochran. He's originally from the US, but moved to Europe a while back, and he was causing chaos throughout the whole state. He thinks that he is a psychoanalyst and a genius, but apparently being a psychoanalyst and a genius doesn't save you when you commit a criminal act. What do I mean by that? Well, let me show you. Now, while his most notorious crime happened in Europe, he has a criminal history right here in the good old United States of America. Let me show you what I mean by that. What you see is a mugshot for Tony Robert Cochran. He was arrested in 2014 by the Springfield, Oregon Police Department, and he was charged with assault in the fourth degree and strangulation. So that should tell you the type of person that we're dealing with here. This guy was causing trouble in his own country. What do you think happens when he goes to other countries? This article comes from a site called The Ham and High. And the title of this article is Judge Jail's Psychoanalyst Con Man from Camden saying, quote unquote, you're delusional. Let's read this article, shall we? A quote unquote, cunning and deceitful psychoanalyst who moved into a patient's house to carry out radical therapy sessions before black blackmailing and stealing from her has been jailed for three years. Tony Cochran, 29, of Handel Street, Camden, was sentenced for fraud, theft, and blackmail at St. Alban's Crown Court on Friday. The American National was found guilty of manipulating a vulnerable woman and moving into her house to carry out quote-unquote radical existential psychoanalysis. He then stole her credit card and attempted to withdraw 1,490 pounds in two minutes at a cash point. The victim who grew up in Hampstead and was described as quote unquote vulnerable and open to abuse had already paid the self-styled psychoanalyst 1,980 pounds for telephone counseling sessions from the states. She told the court during the trial she was quote unquote very charmed by Cochran and was quote unquote eager to please him. She said what was being built up was far more than a professional relationship but Cochran broke her trust and stole her credit card and pen before leaving her Hertfordshire home on March 1st, 2015, the court heard. When the victim went to the police, he tried to blackmail her and concocted a story accusing the woman of sexually assaulting him, the jury heard. She was put through the ordeal of cross-examination about lurid allegations that he had found her masturbating in the hallway of her home next to a dead fish. Cochran, who is the civil partner of film director Ken Russell's son, the artist Alexander Verney Elliott, represented himself during the trial and is likely to face deportation once he has served his prison term. Judge John Plumstead told Cochran he had no professional qualifications as a psychoanalyst and said he, quote, deluded, end quote, himself into thinking he could give therapy to patients. Cochran made a show of opening a seal transcript of his degree qualifications from the witness stand during the trial. But Judge Plumstead told the jury after the guilty verdicts, this is plainly a man who got a moderate education, Rhodes College in small town Oregon, seems to have given him notions of his own capacities that are delusional. He's talked himself into thinking that by reading Jean-Paul Sartre and Heidegger, he can form the basis to give therapy. That 
acts delusional. The victim said after Cochran's conviction that she was, quote, relieved that justice has been served, end quote, and she hoped he would, quote, never be able to commit crime again, end quote. The Ham and High revealed after the trial that Cochran had raised thousands of dollars through the crowdfunding website Indiegogo. The page took donations in the name of Africa Help, Liberia Help Africa, Liberia and Medical Housing Costs, Liberia, but the Ham and High could find no such charities. So you might be asking where exactly is the pedophile apology here? And where is the advocating for pedophiles? Well freaks and geeks you're in luck because I'm gonna show you some actual screenshots of things this guy has actually said. Check this out. He says, As I examine discourses, flows, and streams of codes, words, and interpretations, etymologies, and assemblages within this social organism we call quote western culture end quote. I am discovering a profundity. I think he means profundity, but whatever. We have not yet words or silences for a plethora of phenomena, and yet we utilize hegemonic symbols grounded in medical, biological, and judicial terms. I think he means judicial, but whatever. To describe what is considered abject. Pedophilia, rape, victim, trigger, predator, bad hombres. He's taking a swipe at Trump there, but whatever. Literally, these words don't match common complex, multi-dynamic phenomena. Hiding in them, some find symbolic solace, yet they don't describe anything other than their referent. For example, rape. We are told that rape is about power, domination, and control over the victim. It is not about sex. Well, yes, most times rape is not about sex. It's about power and domination. I mean, even the ugliest person in the world could find sex. And the funny thing about what he just said there, is he actually trying to tell us that Harvey Weinstein taking advantage of people was not about power and domination and control. All he had to do was flash some money. He didn't need to rape anybody, yet he did so, at least if the reports are true. So yes, oftentimes rape is about power, control, and domination. And statements like these are reasons why me and feminists who have read this exact statement from him have both agreed that he is a rape apologist. And before you say, oh, man you're agreeing with feminists even though you normally don't agree with anything they have to say well let me show you why here is another quote from this guy he says i think pedophilia is a sexual orientation not all pedophiles sexually abuse children and not all people who sexually abuse children are pedophiles that's bullshit if you abuse a child on a sexual level and you did it intentionally you are a pedophile he goes on to say as blank has noted i suggest people read about my biography and actual work. Okay, well I tell you what Mr. Cochran, we will do that and I'll show people just how full of shit you really really are. But before that, showing his direct statements is not enough to prove my case. We have to also go to the people who know him best and some of those people are well aware of the things he has done in the past. So let me show you some screenshots and I will be blocking out their names but the comments are applied to him. So here's one person's comment. They say here, did you know him? I met him through a friend and he stayed with me for just one night at a hotel in Portland, Oregon. That was the only time I met him fortunately. He stole cash from my wallet and even kept asking me for my address in Australia as I'd help him get a Greyhound bus ticket with my card. The next morning I contacted my friend that had introduced me to him. She was in Connecticut and I told her what I had suspected anyway. There is a lot more to this story. The guy is a predator and of the nastiest kind. Now mind you, this isn't the original victim from the other story. This is a completely different person. And what do you know, freaks and geeks, I actually found the person who helped get this guy put in prison for three years. They say here, blowing my anonymity afforded to black male victims, I was the woman who, with the help of my sister-in-law, finally stopped this guy. I met him through Icarus on Facebook. And as a side note, Icarus is a Facebook page on Facebook, which is called the Icarus Project. They are heavily social justice and heavily left leaning, but they really do not like this guy and they have a nasty little piece about him. She says here, I try to warn others. It's difficult in a group so big. I know he had interactions with others here. All the allegations he made against me were untrue. Even if they were true, they were no defense for theft, 
fraud and blackmail, but they were untrue all the same. Mind you, this is the same person that he accused of masturbating in a hallway next to dead fish. And then right underneath this comment, somebody else said, yes, I ran into him via another forum years ago. He met his husband there whose family he seems to have stirred things up in a nasty way too. I was sent emails asking for money. Now that is a very important claim because if we were to look back at the Ham and High's article about this guy, they also said that he was asking for donations to charities that didn't even exist. So it would make sense that this would be the exact same type of guy who would go around asking people for money. This person says he and his disgusting perverted deviant friends called me a fascist for being against pedophilia. They were on a friend's post and he went to bat for non-offending pedophiles. I had to check out his page. Yes, he's one. Yes, he totally minimizes the effects, blurs the lines, legitimizes the whole thing. He literally posts about child sexuality. Apparently, Tony Cochran has a history of stealing things from people that wasn't related to the case in the UK. Let me show you what I mean by that. Now, this person came to me in confidence when I asked for help revealing the type of person that Tony Cochran actually is. And so in honoring that request, I will not be showing this person's name. However, the reason why they didn't want their name to be revealed is because they're saying that Tony Cochran is a vindictive type of person who will come after them. But I assured this person that if Tony Cochran decided to do that, I would come after him even harder. But anyways, let's read this comment. So I asked this person, did they have any information? And this was their response. Hi, Dion, which is my real name. I do. I met him in person. At the time, he was going by E.V. Elliott. Now, as a side note, that is a very important tidbit right there about the E.V. Elliott part. The mention of E.V. Elliott will become important later on because Tony Cochran likes to pose as another person and post in his own blog posts and his writings to try to get other people to think that he is some amazing writer, even when he is not. But I digress for now. Moving on, he agreed to come to speak about homeless rights at a conference I was putting on in Phoenix with a grassroots coalition. He knew ahead of time there was no speaker's fee, but that we could provide room and board for his trip. He didn't answer any of our requests for confirmation in the month leading up to the conference though. So we assumed he'd flaked. About a week before the conference, he suddenly hit us up saying he'd rented a car and was driving and would need reimbursement for the rental as well as the speaker's fee and a hotel room. We told him his hotel funds had been reassigned to another speaker since he hadn't responded to any confirmation requests and that there could be no reimbursement and there was never a speaker's fee. We did offer to rearrange the schedule to still allow him to speak and secure him a place to stay for the weekend. He agreed to that. When he got to town, we took him to one of the organizer's apartments and set him up with a couch to sleep on. That very night, he stole a wallet from one of the organizers' roommates and skipped town. He never answered any of our calls or messages until we posted publicly on Facebook warning other organizers about him. He then claimed that we had promised him a speaker's fee and then retracted it. Once I posted the full conversation I'd had with him about it, he blocked me. I'm sure you've seen his convictions for fraud in the UK under his real name. During the time that we were corresponding around around his alleged work for the homeless, he was constantly sharing fundraisers for various causes. When we posted about him publicly, many people came out of the woodwork saying he was constantly requesting money from them and they suspected he was pocketing it. There are a lot of claims there and I will validate at least most of them. And aside from that, we already know that this guy is the type to take your wallet or take your card and steal money from you. So the claim that he stole someone's wallet seems valid based on his criminal history but does he go around spreading fake charities and trying to get money well do you remember the last paragraph that I showed you from the ham and high article about all the African charities that he supposedly was raising money for well before we get into that I'm going to present you with someone
someone else's account and I'll let you be the judge as to whether or not these charities are actually valid because when I google these charities I don't find any record of them except on Indiegogo where Tony Cochran has set them up I don't see any money trail I don't see any pictures showing that this money went to anyone that is in the African continent and aside from that I don't see any evidence of these charities being touted by anyone else except for Tony Cochran but let's go back and validate another claim here Tony Cochran has denied being another person and that person goes by the name of Eliot Vernie Elliott now if you recall from near the beginning of the video Vernie Elliott is the surname of Tony Cochran's life partner so I was very intrigued when I found a blog post calling him out and saying that he is actually Elif. this blog post was written in March 15th of this year it says here some readers of this blog may recall someone named Elif Bernie Elliott in the UK who accused me of being a Nazi because I read Heidegger he even challenged me to a public debate in London at one point a call I obviously ignored he put up several YouTube videos accusing OOO of complicity with fascism etc etc well there's been an interesting twist in the saga of this gentleman one longtime reader of this blog informs me that Elif Verney Elliott seems to be the alias of one Tony Cochran recently convicted of the fraudulent practice of quote radical existential psychoanalysis end quote more than that he talked his patient into moving in with her as part of the treatment tried to steal money from her credit card and made false claims of sexual assault against her I suppose there could be two separate people named Elif Verney Elliott though it seems unlikely addendum this is definitely the same guy now that I've had the chance to compare the two sets of videos ooh that's very interesting because I have some proof that this guy is actually telling the truth here let me show you what I mean by that so when we go over to Elif Verney Elliott's WordPress page we find this on the about page now if you look at this picture right here you might be saying well devil what exactly is that supposed to be telling us well look at this picture here from the ham and high article where Tony Cochran is showing off his quote-unquote African charity do you see that picture does that person look familiar here let me help you out here I'm gonna put the pictures side by side and I want you to tell me in the comment section do they share a striking similarity and if you can't see it I have a wonderful eye doctor that I can refer you to now you may be asking what exactly does this prove and why is this a problem well let me show you why it is a problem Tony Cochran goes around spreading good reviews of his writing if you look at this one other WordPress blog he says here on April 19th 2013 at 7 52 p.m. my time okay so there is a lot of buzzing and humming about a philosopher guy named Elif Bernie Elliott what is his deal I have tried to look at his material but it seems to be an edit or something I went on campus today here in California and the whole department was talking about him even the director of the department who is he now first of all there is no evidence showing that Tony Cochran has ever been to California he's from Oregon and I've seen no record of him ever attending a school in California but I digress he goes on to say just one minute later oh and where does he work I presume that unlike a lot of us here he has a cushy job in England presumably oh but then someone right beneath him calls him out on it they say would it be too much to accuse quote Tony Cochran end quote of being quote Elif Bernie Elliott end quote and that he is running some sort of guerrilla marketing campaign evidence read the comments so not only has multiple people called him out on faking being someone that he's not he even tries to boost his own work on other people's WordPress blogs and that's really really interesting because when you look at the website Indiegogo and you try to search out these charities that Tony Cochran keeps bringing up and collecting money for it makes you wonder if these charities are actually real well freaks and geeks I did my own investigation I scoured the internet and found no record of any of these charities that Tony Cochran is talking about except on Indiegogo and I've seen no evidence that any of that money was going to Africa or Liberia so let me get this straight somebody who is a convicted thief 
in a fraud, stole money from people, and was convicted of that crime. And then on top of that, I've had multiple people come to me saying that he's done the exact same thing to them. He pretends to be somebody that he's not to boost his own work. He's a liar and is someone that you would have to be insane to trust. Do you honestly think that even one of those charities is actually legit? Because if you do, I have some unicorn horns and some Enron stock that I wanna sell you. So then the question becomes, why would he have to lie and pretend to be somebody that he's not in order to make his writings look better? Well, the reason for that is that his writing is absolute garbage. Remember when I said that I would actually go through some of his writings? I will go through a small piece of something that he wrote on his own website. In this article, he tries to make the argument that pedophiles should be added to the LGBT community. And as you can see, this article is relatively recent because he wrote it on September the 15th, 2017. The title of this article is Welcome LGBTQIP or Psychoanalysis, Neurology, Sociology, and Pedophilia. He says here, during 40 days of my 10 month stay in prison, I spent nearly 20 to 48 hours at a time with a pedophile who had sexually abused his 20 month old daughter. Having spent some time before prison practicing non-standard psychoanalysis, I engaged him in analysis. Closeness of space, a small cell, shared toilet, shared meals made us friends. Non-communicative at first, distrustful and distraught, suicidal and feeling a great deal of intrapersonal guilt and disgust, it took some days before he began to open up to me. We discussed the event. I kept it confidential from the other prisoners in the vulnerable prisoners wing, F wing at HMP Bedford. Even though his wing houses known sex offenders, pedophiles are at the lowest level of the prison hierarchy. UK prison rule 45 separates vulnerable prisoners from the general population. These prisoners may be there because of high profile cases. For instance, Hardeep Hunjam and Ian Stewart, neither convicted of sexual offenses. I met both of them, worked with them in the quote unquote shop, played chess with them, and Hunjan was the first person I had a conversation with in prison. His body marked in ink and his presence demonstrated a serial frustration and an intriguing beauty. Being in prison changes the narratives behind the media's headlines. Monsters abound in contemporary discourse, usually those who commit specific interpersonal acts of violence. Almost no one engaged in systemic economic and military violence is imprisoned. However, addressing the signifying chains that lead some people to prison for killing an individual while allowing those who kill millions to live in luxury is the only ancillary part of this article. Bringing my own personal discomfort, at times anger and frustration, to the quote unquote sessions I had with my pedophile cellmate. Coupled with the fact I was in prison for something I didn't do, and that's bullshit, and as a result of being sexually misused myself, provided both a distortion and clarity in our work together. Yet I knew that to understand this unique individual, to understand what is so often hidden and demonized in Western society, I needed to remain non-judgmental and open. This is not to say I wasn't confrontational. During a session in the first week, I had him rethink whether or not, in retrospect, his desire should have precluded him from having children. He said, Tony, that session so painful was like medicine that hurt terribly but I think it's working. You are right. I thought about it and I should have never had children. Eventually throughout the 40 days with him we unraveled the complexities of existence. He had been protecting his girlfriend who also abused their daughter and mind you he doesn't show you any proof of that he's just telling you that. He refused to give information to the police that would bring a criminal case against her. I suggested where does your responsibility lie? You are existentially responsible for your child. You are partly the reason she exists at all. You have no such connection to your girlfriend. After being transferred, I received a letter from him. That because the work we had done and after seeing that his girlfriend would never admit to the abuse in family court, he instructed his counsel to inform the court. The girlfriend was immediately banned from contact with the child and the case progressed. Last I heard, she had only supervised visitation. Once again, he shows no evidence of this. If there was such a case, and this case was actually tried, show the evidence. But I digress. 
while she may not be criminally prosecuted, an outcome that my cellmate and I did not want, he became a prison abolitionist during this time, it is almost certain that she will not have parental rights over her child. A side note, it's not very hard to become a prison abolitionist when you're in prison, but I digress. By being open, the experiences, feelings, and bonding with a pedophile further damage against a child was prevented. So in other words, what you're saying is that because this father, whose name you did not give, whose case you did not point to, was able to tell the truth about what happened with his daughter, which by the way, once again, you haven't shown any evidence that this person actually existed. But even if they did, them being a pedophile and telling the proper authorities about child abuse has no relevance. Because if that person were a pedophile or not a pedophile, they could have done the exact same thing. So you somehow linking someone being a pedophile to preventing child abuse is very weak in this case because that could have happened be that person a pedophile or not a pedophile. And that's even if this case even happened because once again, with other people you actually gave their names. Why is it with this guy you did not give his name? I find that to be very, very interesting. And even if you gave me his name, that wouldn't mean anything to me. And here is why. Because if this person actually existed and they are actually a pedophile who sexually abused a 20 month old baby and then they also saw child abuse happening that was perpetrated by the mother, then that means that this person is not only a terrible human being, but to be honest with you, for him to molest a 20 month old baby and then have child abuse happening that he did not report, honestly, if I had my way and this person actually existed, I would advocate for the death penalty. Because not only did you sexually abuse a baby, but you also, on top of that, allowed an abusive mother to have custody of that child to abuse that child further. So while you think that you are making this pedophile look good, you're making them look even worse. But moving on, paradoxically, demonizing pedophiles does nothing to end their desires and often places them in such social isolation that they cannot seek help. That's bullshit, but whatever. The pedophile says, if I went to my GP doctor and asked for help preventing myself from acting on my desire, they would call the police. I would be prosecuted even for asking for help, he said to me. Once again, that's bullshit. I may not live in the UK, but I know you don't get locked up just for saying that you are a pedophile. You have to actually act on it. But anyways, he goes on to say, I realized that something needed to change. We have both came to the conclusion that Pedophilia is a sexual orientation and desires cannot be changed, but as with any sexual orientation, there are responsibilities. Non-consensual sex between adults are acts of severe violence, and there can be no consensual sexual relations between an adult and a 20-month-old child. I'm glad that he finally realizes that this guy is not a good guy for having sex with a 20-month-old old baby. And no, pedophilia is not a sexual orientation. It is a mental disorder. But as you can see, this is why he has to go around spreading fake reviews of his own work. Because if he didn't, people would reject this bullshit, as they rightfully should. Now, Tony Cochran loves to claim that people are threatening him and wishing for him to be dead. And the funny thing about that is that if you go to Facebook and you look for these alleged threats, you don't find any. Which is funny because if you can make a website and you can make blog posts and you know how to steal someone's credit card and try to withdraw some money, one would think that you would know how to take screenshots. Now the only record of these so-called threats that I could remotely interpret as threats are people saying things such as they hope he dies or someone should come beat him up, which are sentiments that I don't agree with, but if Tony Cochran has such an issue with that, then he has some explaining to do. Let me show you what I mean by that. So I have an archived version of this actual Twitter users page where it's being advertised that there is a National Police Week in Washington DC on May 11th through the 17th in 2014. Now when you look at this tweet, which is a screenshot of a Facebook comment, if you were to look down you will see Tony Robert Cochran and he says, I wish more of you died. So apparently he wants police officers to die. So instead of my normal outro 
intro, I will give you a statement from his victim in the UK. I want you to listen to her entire statement and I understand that this video is very, very long, but when you look at the content of the actual video, I think you understand why it had to be this long. Without further ado, here is the audio file. Tony Robert Cochrane. So, what an interesting fellow we have there. Well, I would say here, but he's not here, he's extradited to Poland since he was convicted of 12 counts of um, theft, fraud and blackmail against me in 2016. The crimes that he committed though were done between December 2014 and uh, the following uh, February. So Tony was actually never convicted of the, the, the most, if you like, major crime that he committed against me and which I suspect by his own admission or his own record of having had 50 clients which he quite boastfully said to me at the end of his time with me and that would be clients of radical existential psychoanalysis which he advertises himself as online particularly to groups of very vulnerable people um, that I fall into the, that category myself through mental illness and childhood sexual abuse uh, through domestic violence and um, the isolation that tends to uh, exist in the UK because um, a lot of people live alone and there's not always that much um, access to things if you live outside of London like things like social things especially with unemployment and if you don't drink alcohol there's not really places to go and if you're like me you have chronic sickness and that makes you unable to work you also don't really have a lot of access to social life so so he found like um, on paper a very vulnerable person in me but in spirit and actually in mind because uh, my psychologist pretty good he found uh, a very strong person uh, Tony Cochran was advertising himself and my mum had advised me to look for somebody to help me like she just left it open-ended about what kind of help that I got but she said they the family would my family would provide me with the money to do that so when I saw his advert I kind of like I felt like I tripped into something really good like oh look I just found someone who might be really useful to me you know they said they were doing sounded very interesting but when I actually spoke with him by phone I found that one of the ways he said that his work was radical was that he as the therapist Therapist would disclose almost equal amounts of information about his personal life as I disclosed to him. I thought that sounded really cool like sometimes I've been in therapy and I found that the distance between the therapist and me is to stop having the to stop seeing the therapist or to kind of like you know stop finding it useful. Tony told me that he was um, an anti-capitalist he gave me an incredibly low rate of work over the course of 12 months so this was supposed to be three times a week contact for 75 minutes each time and um, I paid him £1,280 so for the year that worked out at sort of like an hourly rate of like just nothing but of course Tony wasn't planning to work with me for a year. The, th the way I see it about this disclosure of information about self as therapist it serves to blur the lines between the therapist and the client and with that level of contact three times a week for 75 minutes a time and email contact and and friends on Facebook and I can call him if I have an emergency which I did I think twice and I think I, he said like I had a, a quota of that so I couldn't do that like more than so many times like I had some free calls to him and he yeah he disclosed and, and disclosed and disclosed and the first thing that he disclosed is that he had just got thrown out of his boyfriend's house his boyfriend abused him and beat him and then when he retaliated the police were involved and he you know he ended up being in a police station and so he, you know he really needed this money up front because you know he had no money and he, he came across as extremely likable and I think if we might suppose that Tony was a sociopath then um, I guess we might suppose that um, it's in his best interest to be extremely likable and to find likable affable people to be able to mirror to have a character to slip into with you to get what he needs from you which is invariably money so now I just want to underline here that Tony is advertising himself as a radical existential psych 
a psychoanalyst with credentials and um, good relationships with university um, lecturers and so on and so forth and uh, references so well when I say references the the actual reference for Tony came from his husband and I mean I even I know that you can't accept a reference from like a fa close family member he's a vulnerable man who a lonely person and Tony has done this amazing work with him and it's worth noting um, somebody somebody told me uh, another Tony Cochran su survivor online said that at some point after this husband wrote a letter of support to uh, for Tony in his defense in court um, uh, was then not long after admitted into a psychiatric hospital in crisis so um, you know we, we have to suppose that perhaps Tony's approach to psychoanalysis doesn't quite go deep enough to protect a person from a nervous breakdown you know we, we all, all of us come to human relationships with a certain amount of either skepticism or uh, maybe even suspicion but I'm a very trusting person because I'm an, I'm an open book with most people and I I would be telling a lie if I said that I don't lie but I'm very truthful and he did some uh, I don't know like visualization work with me and stuff that you know I guess he could have just got some of this stuff from reading a book because it turns out that the university that he said he had his credentials from had never heard of him so all of this came out after what happened in uh, January and February 2015 which is just in a nutshell because it is a convoluted story is that I paid for Tony Tony's flight to the UK he had a visa because of his English husband he was he seemed to be in some state of mania that he'd driven all over the place and he'd gone from Oregon up around like driven literally driven across the USA and then got down into New York I mean look the thing with this guy is you know I could just go on and on with details about this um, relationship but quite honestly if he says it's black you know it is white and if he says it's white White, you know it is black and if he says it's gray you know it don't even exist like crude kind of analogy but quite honestly this guy is so full of shit that if you squeezed him you could fertilize your garden for the next three years I'm just gonna cut to the chase with the rest of the story he came to the UK he came to stay with me in the court case they said like that he came to stay with me to do like intensive therapy like that was bullshit but I was never sure about this guy and he's supposed to be gay like I, I'm not one to put people in boxes or label the boxes you know I'm sure that sexuality is more fluid than some people appreciate but like it was just not quite normal and I just had really no I don't know if it's boundaries or what exactly but I couldn't say no to him like he's in for a penny in for a pound I was I was with this guy like all the way for this radical existential psych psychoanalysis which by the way like I never got any of that like I just didn't like I just spoke to him instead of all my other friends so I was cut off from all my other support network on the phone and I spoke to him all this time every week and like like I I would say I did work in that time like I filled the air, air time like I'm not really sure what can have come of that because the end result was that he came to my home he was acting manic and I don't think he actually was manic because like it was just like stupid behavior like putting on running the dishwasher with like a plate and a fork in it and shit and all this kind of I know what I would call like pretend um psychological angst that he was telling me and I know from um somebody else who was like touched by Cochrane that he is whoever you need him to be like if you need this he will have that and it's everything is fabricated so his stories to me about his grandma and his grandpa and his mother like I have no reason to believe that any of that is true Tony was just playing games with himself and I spent the majority of the week lying on the sofa and and just watching this kind of Cochrane play going on around me you know what can I say like his allegations against me that came out in the, the following or that same November were of about five or so counts of really quite vile sexual assault and um yeah like disgusting so I was out in town a friend was staying with me over the Christmas he called me and he said you need to come home there's some police here now at that time I had in involvement with police on a completely different matter that I was pursuing and so I just kind of assumed that they'd come to speak to me about that so I went home and I met these two police officers and oh sorry I'm thinking I think it was actually one police officer and I was just waiting for them to be like 
tell me something good. And he says to me, oh, how long have you had your aquarium? And I said, well, I bought that in January of this year. And Tony had alleged in his statement that uh, this was one particular thing that, uh, you know, people remember. And it was even printed in the newspaper, which like I, I don't even know why because it has no relevance to uh, the theft and the fraud and the blackmail that Tony was 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 convicted of. But he said that I had smashed the the glass of the aquarium and then he found me lying on the floor masturbating next to a dead fish. Now the trouble with Tony is that he thinks he's very intelligent and he'd like you to think of him as a creative. And the trouble is that when you fabricate stories like that, you're not going to get a degree in creative writing because that's just appalling. And one thing that really strikes me is that if he was going to say that I smashed the, the glass of the aquarium, he should have said what I used to do it the glass of an aquarium is really thick and heavy and I would imagine that even with a, a rock like a brick I would still not be able to smash the glass of my aquarium and dent it probably crack it but not smash it I mean I had visions of like water coming out and fish dying and jumping all over the floor and I just thought what the hell is this guy on that he 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 stashes away this little report of me there was other things like I went out and I was doing drugs and I, I molested him in the shower and um, he spent the entire week with me screaming and shouting at him. I spent the vast majority of that week in my dressing gown or under a blanket on the sofa. I hardly moved. I hardly spoke to him. I listened to his bullshit. I didn't take any of it in. And after a week, he left with my credit card that he'd intercepted in the post. I think it arrived the last day that the like the last morning he was there. And also the pin number which he had intercepted in the post as well. I'd had to order that credit card because I had rinsed my bank account to give him the money for his counselling. Sorry, I should correct myself there that I was reimbursed for that money. But I'd actually put a lot of money into my daughter's, um, uh, like a savings account for my daughter. I took that money out to pay him. I mean, I'm not great with money, let's be honest. But I also um, paid for his flight and everything like this and the taxi from the airport. So in, in, in other words, I had no money and I had ordered a credit card, which I was expecting to arrive in time for me to pay for his flight with. But it arrived when he was there and actually the pin number was on a piece of paper and it was it was in my bedroom by the door and he knew where that was and so he took that the morning that he left. I woke up, it was about, I don't know what time of, of the morning it was, but I remember it being really bright. So it was like February, you know, that like bright February morning or even maybe into the afternoon, to be honest, I can't remember what time it was. And I knew he was gone. I'd given him a mobile phone, which he'd taken, but my, I, I left my mobile phone downstairs because I have a habit of staying online and not sleeping. And he had deleted everything, like all record of himself. And he emailed himself from my phone um, saying, I'm sorry, take a little something for yourself, sweetie, like all this kind of thing. Like, and the, this is the pin number and all this kind of thing and he tried to use that as evidence in court to say that I had given him my um, credit card and also to say um jeez oh, what was it um do you know what I'm, I'm not even fucking sure this guy had no bloody defense anyway like because the whole thing was a crock of shit and the mad thing about it for me like as, as somebody like the, the 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 main person involved because obviously like this is first hand is when we went to court and by the way it was my sister-in-law who actually reported it to the police like I'm not sure what I would have done I think I could have really broken and um, I've actually said to the devil's advocate on another occasion that I think he would really like that. I think if this history of having 50, uh, let's call them victims, not clients in the past, if that was true, then, you know, that's potentially 50 very broken people. And I certainly know four other people just through being online and, and, and like, you know, I know of four other people. Actually, hang on a second. One, two, three, four. There's four. I think there's five that I know of and four that I'm in contact with. Something like that anyway. But just trying to say this guy is trying to wreck lives and will go. It's like he's he's dangerous. Trust me, he's dangerous. He might look pretty, but he's dangerous. And when I saw him in court, I just, I mean, me and my sister-in-law, we didn't stay for the whole thing. We gave our evidence over two days and we left 
because we weren't giving him an audience. But I noticed when I was in the courtroom that he he really believed in himself, or at least he was maybe trying to show that to the judge, you know, that he was, you know, telling the truth or whatever. But he seemed to really believe, like, in himself like in his position as in the right and on the right side of the law so i don't know what to make of him exactly because he just goes from person to person and slips in and out of personas and characters and having different histories to extract what he needs at the time um but let me just say that i don't know what to make of this guy he says he has bipolar disorder he says he has lamotrigine he behaves like a psychopath he continues to write inflammatory things online about me, about paedophilia. I mean, he just, he just really is going to do, he's either, you know, somebody's going to hit him in the head so hard that he will never do, he will, won't be capable of doing anything like this again, or he's going to do something really serious and like watch this space for the name Tony Robert Cochran in the future, because you will hear that he has committed something so heinous and so dramatic and crude that everyone will know about it so i have to thank you tony robert cochran not for your existential radical psychoanalysis but for your bullshit i have grown you know you are a supreme manure maker of bullshit and i thank you i am glad i am so grateful that you have left my life please leave me alone please don't write any more about me or talk about things that you don't understand uh, pedophilia i mean are you a pedophile tony you know do you need some therapy